Welcome to our meditation on this Wednesday of Holy Week. Let us pray. Lord God, whose blessed Son, our Savior, gave his body to be whipped and his face to be spit upon, give us grace to accept joyfully the sufferings of the present time, confident of the glory that shall be revealed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. At supper with his friends, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival or that he should give something to the poor. So, after receiving the piece of bread, he immediately went out. And it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. The word of the Lord. And it was night. How much deeper into the darkness are we going to descend this week? I can see why this scene was cut. Why the moment where Satan enters Judas doesn't make one of the prime time liturgies of Holy Week. It's too disturbing to contemplate. How do we wring good news out of this one? We're told that Jesus hands Judas a piece of bread at the Last Supper, and it's at this moment that Satan enters into him. Some of us might reject the passage on this phrase alone. Satan isn't given much credence these days. Whenever anyone implies that the devil made me do it, we assume that they're evading responsibility, and cravenly seeking sympathy when they should rightly be held accountable. We could say that John, our gospel writer, is cheapening the narrative and letting Judas off the hook by throwing Satan into the mix. Except that John doesn't throw Satan around casually. We don't hear stories about Jesus exercising demons in John. We don't hear anything about a conversation between Jesus and Satan in the wilderness. Most of the time, evil is not that easy to see or to hear. Most of us do not engage it that directly. There's a reason that John does not play this card until now. Whatever else might motivate Judas to betray his friend, there's an evil present here that goes beyond Judas's individual choice. Even Jesus is troubled by it. I'm not saying that Judas is acting against his own free will here. There just, there just seems to be a stronger current pushing him along, one that exceeds the sheer force of his willpower. It's popular these days to try to humanize Judas's actions and 
not just because of Jesus Christ the superstar. Something in us recoils from turning Judas into a mustache-twirling villain. We don't want to think that anyone could be that close to Jesus, could spend three years in his inner circle, could live that closely to the human face of God in this world, and then turn around and participate in evil. We don't want to think that anyone could take bread from Jesus' table and then get swept up in something so horrifically violent and wrong. If that kind of openness to evil was present in Judas, who's to say that it's not present in us? I wish that I could tell you that the bread that we're offered here at this altar provides some magic inoculation from evil, that the impact of our actions will never reach beyond the limits of our intentions. But I can't. Holy Week does not just tell us what some misguided people did to Jesus 2,000 years ago. It holds the mirror up to our own cowardice and greed, our own susceptibility to violent ambition and pride. And if we cannot see how we collude to silence the prophets in our midst, if we don't recognize the cost and the bloody mess of our scapegoating, in the actions of those surrounding Jesus, then how can we ever truly be freed from it? In order for a resurrection to happen, something has to die. It's tempting during Holy Week to close our eyes, to sleep our way through the night, to pretend that it doesn't touch us. But I'm not sure that teaches us anything or that it even makes best use of the darkness. It certainly does not release our death grip on violence, or jealousy, or fear. I wonder, I wonder what would happen if we let ourselves stay awake this year, if we stopped using night as our chance to hide, if we let our illusions of righteousness die so that something more honest more life-giving could be reborn in us. I mean, how else does anything begin to grow but in the dark? Perhaps that is as close as we're going to come to good news today. As John Updike once put it, the bad news can be told full out, for it is not the only news. Tomorrow, the camera will pan out a bit more, We'll see the frame in which today's story was first told. We'll see Jesus humble himself and wash the feet of the friend who will betray him. In the name of the one who shows us how to love, even in darkness. Amen. closing prayer is adapted from Meditations of the Heart by Howard Thurman. Let us pray. Today we bear our lives to the scrutiny, to the judgment, to the love of God. There is so much that burdens the mind, that peoples the thoughts, that again and again we are confused, even in the great quiet presence of God. We yield to God our confusions, the chaos of our minds and spirits, the tensions that tame the glory, the love of God out of our lives. We yield to God our frailties and limitations, the desires of our minds and hearts, the desires of which we are ashamed, those desires that buffet our spirits and torture our minds and yet seem to cling to us with such tenacity we yield our joys, the joy in being alive, the joy in renewed friendships, the joy in reestablished and reconciled lives, the joy in the day's work and the night's rest. We 
sheer joy of being loved, caring, and being cared for. We yield our concerns for the world, where we are exposed to so much that casts down and depresses, to little that uplifts and inspires. War, and the threat of war, the long loneliness and the death watch, which seems to stalk our culture and fill our civilization with deadly dry rot. We yield our lives, the nerve centers of our consent, must the mainsprings of all our values collapse and we become like shadows in the night. All of this, and more than tongue can say and heart can feel and mind can think, all of this we yield to the scrutiny, to the judgment, and to the love of God. Amen.
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>